Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Our interview last week was so good that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. If you missed last week, you'll find the link in the show notes. It's not mandatory that you listen, but we want to make sure that you don't miss out on this amazing conversation. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Roxanne Durhach. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Uh, today, I have a special new colleague, and uh, Oliver and, and I just... Um, are a part of a new mastermind, uh, which I feel very, very privileged to be involved with. And Oliver is um, has done some fascinating work. Um, uh, he's been in the field of leadership. I'm going to say leadership consulting for well over, we don't want to date you now, Oliver, but over 25, 30 years. And um, he's, I'm going to say focusing on an area that um, we're seeing a lot more of uh, lately in the business consulting world, which is stepping out from the top, where senior leaders kind of are finding that next step about, so now what? I've I've worked very really hard. I've, I've uh, created this space. I've maybe started a legacy with the company that I'm with. And so like now, what do we do? So Oliver, thanks so much for coming in today to chat with us. My pleasure, Roxanne. It is scary, right? So it's about embracing that. And even me, now I'm going to be 57 in January. Um, and then I'm talking about all these things that I want to do. But I find my some of my um, people around me, maybe not people in the same kind of roles, are thinking about slowing down. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I have this and this and this to do. So you're having different, it's like you're having like mm -hmm. one, like you said, you're right, arrivals or departures and nothing against people that want, you know, to, to slow down. But sometimes you, you have to find the right groups to be able to have those conversations because you know what, if you want to stop completely at 55, that's fantastic. But what are you going to do with that time if you do decide to retire? And if you are going to continue, how is it that you tap into, to your point, that last golden yeah. 30 years, right? Yeah. And, and the rules of the game have broken down, thank goodness. Um, I mean, in terms of retirement, retirement is a relatively new concept. It was introduced in Germany in 1881. At that stage, the retirement age was set at 70. But the life expectancy was much less than that. Right? So most people died anyway before they ever got to that. In the United States, um, the, the retirement age was set at 65. And at that stage, life expectancy was 58. So again, in the US, it was done. We create this retirement thing, but we expect very, very few people to get there. The retirement age has sort of stuck around 60, 65. That, now, as a, as a recognize, I know people will do it differently, but that, and yet we're living to 90 plus. So the whole thing is broken down. And if you look at the, the, the old career model of education, career, retirement, mm -hmm. that if you look at the bit between career and retirement, there's now a bit which is, post the main role that you've had and retiring, which is stopping work. And that can go on for 20 years. I'm part of that. I mean, I've been in it for 10 years and it tend to go on for quite a while longer. So we do really need to rethink this, both as a society, but also each of us individually and go, if I, it's why I use the word step, or the term stepping out rather than retiring, because you step out from the, the role you're doing and you're, and I, you're either going to retire and what does that mean? Because there's retiring and still working, retiring to a very rich leisure life, retiring to whatever, or I'm going to still, I'm going to keep working, but I'm going to work less or whatever. So it's an area that, that we don't have the concepts and the words yet familiar to help 
help people think it through what it really means. So let's let's you know in your the report um, that that uh, you're putting out, mm-hmm. it talked about companies really getting prepared, um, and there was some data that came from that. So let's talk about some of the companies that you have been uh, have worked with or that you know of that have mm-hmm. done it well for that middle subset, and what kind of things are they putting in place, or maybe what are the um, what are kind of the things that they're recognizing they need to implement and they're starting to, and what is still a struggle with, with, the, with okay. the companies that you work with? I mean, I think if, if we stand back and take it from an organizational, through, look at it through an organizational lens and quite a long-term lens, there's plenty of evidence that even large companies and, and many successful companies still view, for example, a change in the chief executive or a change in the chief finance officer, a change in whatever, they treat them as one-off events mm-hmm. when they're actually part of an ongoing process of, of people leaving and people starting. Okay. Um, and again, there's pretty good evidence that it's one of the most important things that happens in an organization, the change of a, of a senior executive affects share price, reputation, uh, buy in from employees, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and 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 if we get, and I think it's it's between twenty eight and thirty eight percent. I think it is of senior level transitions are disappointments. Mm. Either they fail completely, or they don't bring what was expected. Um, and what, that's huge. And and they re, they, there's one Harvard statistic that um, the impact of getting transitions wrong in the top of, in the top companies uh, equates to a trillion dollars a year uh, in in lost effectiveness, in loss of value, and whatever. So it's it's a you know it's a big thing, and yet. Today, I mean, and in the survey we did, the very great majority of organizations are not, don't have a formal approach to enabling their senior leaders to leave well and therefore create the space for the new leaders to arrive and to do that in an effective and seamless way. And a couple of, couple of um, implications of that. One is that... Um, if you're not careful, you're, if you pick successors, you're ripening your successors to be picked by your, your competitors because you get them ready to take over, but you don't manage the bit of when are pe- the incumbents going to be leaving. So they're left hanging around ready to go. And you've just ripened them for your competitor to go, hey, well, come and work with us because we've got... So, you know, there's a lot of damage going to be done that way. Um, and we're proposing at the moment that succession planning, it needs to be redefined. Because at the moment, I did a Google search of 20 um, definitions of succession planning. Okay, so from, you know, from Harvard through... Uh, a whole range of different companies and whatever. Every one of them the same. It was about identifying and developing your leaders to take over. Okay. Not one of them mentioned helping the senior leaders existent to exit gracefully and well. So it's a little bit like succession planning that is is aimed at one side of the equation and we're completely missing the other. As somebody said to me, um, it's a little bit like in an athletics relay race. We're concentrating on all our efforts on helping the person who's going to receive the baton, but we're not doing anything to help the person who's actually going to hand it over. So it it just it just doesn't make any sense. So that's why our proposition is we need to have a much more formal and thought through approach to this and enable people to leave well, feeling supported. So they leave as advocates and ambassadors. They make sure that succession is working right and whatever, and then have the people who are ready to succeed prepared and ready to take over. So you create seamless transitions. Well, if the that's the business case yeah of course if that's costing you saying it's being done 
probably to the, the amount of a trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. Yeah. And it, if you were to address it well, like you said, and there's no one particular way to do it in reference to, to planning. It depends on industry and, um, you know, all that things, you know, the demographics of your, of your teams, those types of things. But starting to think about it, like you said, if as much as 10 years out, which the thought of 10 years out, you know, that's a lot of people would be like, whoa, that's, that's really, really soon. But with a lot, a lot of changes that happens within companies, I would think of, you know, most of the, you know, when I manage my portfolio on health and wellness, any company was in flux, 75% of my portfolio was in flux at any given point. Right. So clearly there's there's yeah. constant change happening. So that's showing you that people need to plan. Well, here's so, Roxanne, here's some of the numbers from the this the study. Um so we asked, uh, we did obviously desk research and we did a number of um one-to-one structured interviews, and then we surveyed 92 um senior HR business partners to try and get a sense of this. What we learned from that is that 5% of senior leaders are rated as well equipped for life beyond the organization. 95% aren't well equipped. Right? Wow. So there, there's something to think about. 23% of organizations are rated as very supportive of their senior leaders as they, they think and plan. Um, so all the rest aren't. Right. Um, and that not, only 9% of organizations have a formal approach. Yet, 80% of more than 80% of the HR business partners said we should have a formal approach. So there's something not connecting here, in, in, you know, in that. And um, I'm delighted of the opportunity to highlight and go think about it. It is, you know, it is, there are big costs to not getting this right. And not just financial costs, but reputational costs, opportunity costs, and the view of whether you're a good company to work for, all of those things are are actually affected by. Right. And why, you know, if you have the opportunity to create something that's more formal, and when somebody leaves at the right time, you you, you create champions. Because if I've been with a company and I've spent the majority of my time building this identity of this company along with feeling very good and I'm leaving on a, on a good note I'm going to be the best champion and advocate I'm going to yeah. be talking about it you know in every different realm versus if I had a horrible experience I'm, I'm maybe going to be a bit disgruntled and I'm not going to be saying the best thing and we know that with social proof out there guess what that, mm. that you know it it does spread like wildfire when people start sharing things now, I would like you to speak to, you know, just maybe any senior executives um, listening to this and he or she's like, well, we don't even have anything. What, where do, you know, where, how do I, what do I do? I, I need the support. I'm scared because I haven't even thought about this or I'm running from my feet. Yes. I, I, there's not, this is a, another thing to add to my to-do list, Oliver. Yeah. Um, what, what would you tell them to do as some primary steps to start I'm, I'm- up? You know, and another one is, I know I should be thinking about this, and I keep meaning to think about it, right. and then I don't, right? Because that that's also very common. Um, I think I think there's a, a num- I think there's a number of things. I think first of all, it's important to understand what's going on. Okay, so understand that it's a transition, and it's a, one of the most major transitions in your life. And even if you hang on by your fingernails, it will eventually happen. Okay. So it's going to happen. So, so think about it. Um, and it's multidimensional because it can involve your identity. It can involve your relationships. It can involve your, in, you know, involve your intellectual activity, your physical and emotional well being, your finances. But as well as that, it will change your daily routines and your habits so this is a big thing to move through and i think first of all to understand that um second is to understand that you have a choice you can you can see it as coming into the arrivals hall or you can see it as departing from the departure line that's just the choice of which way you're going to do it and you can understand your finances so you really understand what you can afford i i had one senior person I would say life is different for everybody and and she said to me no my finances are in good order which they were and she said you know we tend to live a pretty frugal life 
I mean, we do have three racehorses, but <laughs> I'm going, that doesn't sound like a frugal life to me, but we all judge it at whatever level we're at. Um, but knowing that it's a question of is enough, when is it is enough enough? And very often as we get towards the, the latter stages of our, one of the things that maybe about the 50s is our wisdom increases. And we start to go, there isn't as much value to ever chasing ever more. Actually settling for enough is enough. And therefore I can I can I can live the lifestyle much more. So so working that out and, and you know understanding that um and just understanding that sense about being 50 something if you happen to be in that, that you know at the top of your career curve, the bottom of your happiness curve, your own ageist views might start to play out against you. And also other people's views of that may well start to impact because other people will take decisions about you. So understanding that. Then to reflect. And I think the reflect, there's a million things to reflect on, obviously, but from the ones in my experience, both my own experience and working with other people, is that sense of the grim reaper coming into view. That when we were 20, if we were healthy, we would probably think about it. Yet later towards the, the end of your career and you've been, it does sort of come into view more at that point. Uh, so what meaning do you give to the rest of your time on the planet? And what does that mean to direct you where your energies will go and whatever? Um, however, the excitement of, unless you have something that will restrict your life, you know, your lifespan, you've probably another 30 plus years. So what are you going to, how are you going to make that extraordinary? And um, I think also to reflect on, therefore, when you get that, what will be important? And as a result, what will be unimportant? So maybe, and this is a man, man, man thing, I think, but maybe the Mercedes in the car park will be less important in the future than it is now. Or the Gucci bag will, will a, a, a smaller one will do, you know, whatever those things are. It's just, just being clear about that. Um, there's also, I think, something about what will you miss? You know, you're in an exciting job, you're doing exciting things, there's lots of benefits and rewards and there's status and there's all of that. What are the things you're going to miss when you do it? Because coming to terms with that is important. I, I can tell you that of all the people I've coached, um, no one has, no one yet has said to me, um, I wish I'd, I'd not done this, you know, the stepping out bit. But lots of people say, I wish I'd done this sooner because actually the rewards I was getting from working are not the rewards I'm now looking for or whatever else. And um, and also to think about what's getting in the way, what's stopping me from moving forward. And then the last bit is the plan. Now, the, I think there are three horizons to plan for. The one is, what's my plan to finish well? OK, so what I need to do to finish well. The second one is, what am I going to do with the, 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 the next third of my life? But there's one in between that is, how am I going to manage the first six months? Because that's when a lot of things derail and you're experimenting. And work is the operating principle of your life if you're a senior leader. It defines a lot about when you take holidays, when you go home, it's it. Once that's gone... What's going to be the operating principle for your life and how do you create that? Um, so those things can, can you know, so the three horizons and then in terms of the next 30 years or at least the next five years, a couple of things to, to think about. First of all, life is an improvisory art. You know, uh, you can't, an, an improvised re-art. An improvisory art. So it's, yeah, yes, it's yes. the art of improvisation. OK, um, the second thing is A to B planning doesn't work, which is what most of us do. We go, I'm at point A. How do I get to point B? What are the actions I need to take? When you're thinking of something as enormous as the next third of your life, it's not A to B. For I know I know this from the people. It's 85 percent of people. A to B doesn't work because it's it's A to B or maybe C or D or E or even F or G. 
how, how do you plan for that? Well, that's the reality and it is planable for. Um, and the methodology that I use with people is option appraisal, is to go, first of all, what is it? How are you going to judge the options for what you do after you've stepped out? That can be, um, I ask the people, you know, how do you want to feel when you wake up in the morning? And they go, I want to feel challenged. I want to feel energetic. I want to feel inspired. And I go, okay, well, well. so that's one of your criteria of what you do next. And um, people will say, I also, I don't have enough money to completely retire. So I will need to do some work. Okay. But I want to be well paid. So that's another criteria. Um, another one comes from, I want to spend more time with the people I love most. And I see, I feel as there's a deficit there. So whatever I do next needs to allow me to do that. And then there's the ones like, you know, I want to play the, want to learn to play the piano. So whatever those are. And then you look at what are your options. So what sort of things could you do? So you could retire to the sofa and daytime TV. The problem with that is you probably die pretty quickly. Right. Um, so it's, uh, to me, it's never a good option. You can retire to retired, but doing some work. You can do like I've done, which is to have an encore career, which is less pressurized and more enjoyable. And then said that you can, um, you know, you can retire to leisure projects. I know lots of people who retire from busy um, careers and going to go right now. I'm going to climb Mount Everest. Actually, quite literally, not, that's my work. That replaces my work project with something. Else. So there's lots of different options. And then. If you create those ups and go, well, which ones will match the appraisal criteria I've set first? And then that starts to create a blueprint for going, okay, these are the things that might work for me. These are the things that will make me feel the way I want to feel. And then the trick that I learned from um, someone I was working with, he said, you know, I will not know. If, I get, if any of these opportunities come along, I won't know in advance, but when they come along, I know intuitively whether they're right for me or not. So I said, what does that mean? He said, so I should I should pursue all of these options right, and actively pursue them. And then as opportunities are, I know which ones suit me best and whatever. So there's a way of planning for this that's different to what we normally do. So you're reassessing, you're giving yourself enough time to be able to say, oh, this one, this option, this and this might work, but this isn't going to work. And oh, I like this one. Oh, I hadn't thought about that one. So you're really kind of um, pivoting or adjusting as you go, giving yourself yeah. time to be able to get to the to the end point and yeah. not just arriving at the end point, like you said, with the one individual six weeks out or the guy that says, I'm yeah. at home. <laughs> um, you're giving yourself the the time to really be reflective and say, you know, um, and as a clinician, one thing that uh, I often say to people when I'm trying to understand what they value is, it's an exercise, um, you know, if, if you were reflecting back, if you're, you're on your deathbed, basically, mm -hmm. and you're looking back, and um, you're going to, the, the, you know, person on their deathbed is going to tell the younger version of themselves, um, they're going to open their eye, and they don't know it, but this miracle had happened. And they're going to basically tell it, create a narrative of everything that needs to be there. So kind of on a clinical end, it makes mm. sense. Because what you're talking is about value alignment um, and then thinking through scenarios and, and kind of, you know, practicing them a bit and, and learning, oh, that's not going to work. This is going to work. So at the end of it, you have some semblance of a model of some sort that you can work from, which makes so, yeah. much, which makes so much sense, Oliver. And, and you see, Roxanne, the reason that that, that probably should exist. Mm -hmm. But in many organizations, actually the great majority of organizations, what I can see, senior leaders thinking about stepping out remains an unmentionable. You don't declare it, you don't talk about it. I'll give you an example of that. They, in one of the big global law firms, mm -hmm. their policies are such that your final, your final package is worked out on the revenues you generate in the previous three years. Oh. If three years out you go, I'm thinking of retiring or stepping out, yeah. the revenue streams dry up and you so declaring it becomes nonsensical. And these are very smart people. So so why would you do that? Um, 
one of the impacts of that is so people don't have role models. They don't see people doing it successfully because nobody talks about it until very close to when they've left. So we don't know how, we really don't know how to do this. And therefore that idea of having to create that make sense of the storyline of our life with this in the context of, is some heavy lifting we might have to do at this point, if that and makes sense. sharing the narratives of all these successes, right? Like, I mean, how yeah. important is that, right? Because I think that's that's the important thing is if you have all these successful transitions, right? But they're not allowed to share it at some point yeah. having like your coaches or whatever, be able to, to, to spend that time with them, I think would afford them the space. And, oh, okay. and it's why it's why our accredited coaches have all stepped out themselves. Mm, so which makes so much, much sense, right? It so they know what it feels it, like, you know? Yeah, I, remember, I remember myself and how poorly I did it. And I was like, you know, um, you know, had the outplacement services and whatever, but I was going to the, I, I was trying to, you know, find that rhythm and I was going to the outpatient pla the placement um, satellite, satellite services because I was trying to find, I was, I was so structured. So guess what? I was like, okay, I'm going to go through the tumble cycle here several times. Then I realized, why do I need to go there? <laughs> but it took mm -hmm. me kind of doing that for a bit before yeah. I kind of started to, because then all of a sudden, cell phone gone, laptop gone, you know, yeah. kind of, all right. So like, what do I do with my, now what is, what is it that I'm going to do with my, you know, my time? Mm -hmm. And then it's funny, you're right. You, you start to, you know, figure it out a bit at a time. And that's a rough period there to your point. The first couple of months, you're like, okay, what am I going to do until you kind of start to find, like I found a coach relatively quickly and um, started to figure out things, but it's still a lonely time. And then you're reflecting on that time, that legacy piece that you've left behind and the connections and all those things, Absolutely. right? That you want to take with you. And I mean, clearly if you do it well, I have most of the connections of the people I wanted to stay with. Not everybody, mm -hmm. but the ones that I wanted to stay involved in. Now, Oliver, one last question I have for you. Are for companies, right? We know the impact. We know if, if the lack of investment is costing a oh. trillion dollars. So pe for people that are companies that are thinking, you know what? This makes so much sense. I can see it. You know, I can see how it's kind of hit our bottom yeah. line. What what kinds of things should they be considering? And then I want you to tell them where they can get a hold of you so that you can support them through this. Yeah. My experience is to start small. Okay. So if you think supporting our senior, I'll give you one example again. It was a law firm, global law firm, and they hadn't done this before. They now it's a formal approach and they they um they do it a lot. That one one of their partners was hurting, right? And they said to the partner, would you like some support to help you to leave well? He said, I would love that. And he had been through an episode of um, psychiatric disturbance, okay? So as well as all the stuff, we've been 50, something, whatever, and a couple of incidents has had, had in his law practice that he felt damaged his reputation as well. So he was in a very vulnerable spot. Um, and on a review, I could have kissed him, on a, a Zoom review, um, he said to the person who'd commissioned it, um, you know, quite honestly, having been a lifer in the, com in the firm, I was leaving unhappy, disgruntled and annoyed. He said, because you made this coaching available, I'm now leaving as an ambassador and an advocate. Okay. And I said to him, would you be prepared for the person you're talking to to reflect that to other people? So there was a there was an example to build from. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, inevitably, there is resistance. There is people who will go, you know, senior leaders are not a, an endangered species. Uh, they don't deserve sympathy. They're very well paid. They're very capable. And you go, yes, but the business case is to get the succession right between them leaving and the other person and, and, and encourage that. So one of the things that I do is work with the chief people officer, for example, to 
how do you engage the organization? Because at the end of the day, it's probably the board chair or the chief executive has to go, yes, let's do this. Mm -hmm. So how do you get to them? And having one or two real examples of where it's worked. Also, um, I mean, I've, um, I'm going to be in the next few weeks doing a session with the executive leadership team of quite a large finance company and it's a European uh, team. And we're proposing to them to go, should we sponsor helping our senior leaders to step out as part of a formal process? I know I could, I would put as much money as you want and at the end it would go, yes, because the case is very logical and whatever. And once you've got that, then you can start to say, how do we put this into place and whatever. But it's that sense of being, and I think that's why it is useful to talk to someone who knows what they're talking about. And if I've convinced anybody that that's me, then I'm really happy to talk to them about how you might go forward. I work in the, because I'm passionate about this, I work in the basis that I'm very happy to do um, no strings conversations. Amazing. And if from that, then people go, I see it is worth taking it forward, then we can talk about uh, what it's going to cost. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm committed to going, there's something here that we need to get better at. So I'm very happy to support that. Awesome. Well, building that business case, right? To take it forward, you have to be able to have, um, you know, the bottom line numbers that are associated with why this is an important thing to implement. So this has been an amazing conversation, Oliver. I so enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. I now understand how uh, my transition, uh, how it went and uh, why I bumbled. Uh, so I feel like I, I'm probably in that subset of, okay, you're out, but now what do you do? So I've learned a bit more about myself. So for everyone, like, you know, just reflect on where you're at if you're a senior leader. Um, if you're, uh, you know, chair of a board and you're recognizing, um, you know, that you are taking care of the person that the baton is being handed to, um, what are you doing with the people that are, are the ones that start off the handoff? And what duty do you have to them? Because as we know with business, it's out there, um, our, our face, our legacy is out there in the social imprints on social media. And I think it's just being nice to people that have been good to you, that have built your businesses. And uh, what a nice way to transition off by thinking this through. So that, and in, in turn, what you're doing for your businesses, you're, you're creating a better bottom line if you can, um, you know, uh, shift that percentage down because you've prepared. So that's what I'm walking away with. Oliver, again, thanks so much. It's been an amazing conversation for everyone. Um, if you're wanting to know a bit more about your relationships and how you connect on an authentic level, either at work or at home, you can go to my website at roxanderhodge.com forward slash quiz. We do a mini quiz. We send you a little report. And if you need to chat further about next steps, um, I'd be more than happy to do that. Again, Oliver, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Roxanne, thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.